Okay, so um, how does this postsynaptic cell know what the heck to do? Um, so how do you get this postsynaptic cell either to get an action potential or not get an action potential? Let's say we're trying to make it get an action potential, but we've got all of these conflicting goals with these different neurons. So generally speaking, even if I were a one-to-one -one relationship, usually, let's say I'm just dealing with this guy right here, okay? Um, usually one action potential and one neurotransmitter release from one presynaptic cell is not enough to get the postsynaptic cell to an action potential. So let's look back here and say, okay, I'm just going to look at a single synapse, that a single excitatory synapse is releasing a neurotransmitter once going to get the, this one to an action potential. No, it generally doesn't. So let's talk about a couple of different ways in which you could get to an action potential theoretically. Okay, so um, the first picture, we have to kind of look at these carefully. The first picture right here, it's the same thing that we were looking at before, but this one is only using a single synapse, A. It's an excitatory synapse, okay? And then this one is going to be using A, B, and C. So the first thing I want to talk about is just using one synapse, one pre, one post. How do I get that postsynaptic cell to an action potential? So this concept is called summation. Um, generally speaking, many action potentials on the presynaptic cell are required um, to release enough neurotransmitter to open enough, for instance, ligand-gated sodium channels to reach threshold on the postsynaptic neuron. So what's going to happen, so if I just stimulated A once, and let's say this is an EPSP, it's an excitatory synapse, then I'm going to get a little bit of a depolarization. If I let it completely repolarize back to minus 70, and I simulate A again, I don't get any additive effect of the depolarization. But what if instead I stimulated A more frequently over a short time period? What if instead of going A, repolarize A again, what if I said A, A? What happens is I depolarize and I don't let it repolarize all the way back to resting membrane potential before I stimulate it again. And what's happening is you're adding the depolarization of the first one to the depolarization of the second one, and then you can get an action potential more quickly. So this is called summation or temporal summation, temporal as in time. So stimulate the postsynaptic cell again before the first EPSP has died away and it adds to the number of open ion channels and the depolarization, bringing it closer to threshold. So why do we not have to deal with a refractory period here? Remember, remember that refractory periods occur after you hit threshold, not before you hit threshold. Refractory periods are um, a characteristic of action potentials, and here you're still a graded potential. So you haven't like change the status of your voltage gated ion channels yet so you don't have to worry about um, refractory periods. Okay, the other way that you could do this is to use more synapses instead of one synapse more frequently than more synapses and that's what this one is trying to show you. So in this picture you've got two excitatory synapses and one inhibitory synapse. So this is called spatial summation, and what happens with spatial summation is, watch, if I stimulate A alone, I get a little depolarization. Stimulate B alone, I get a de little depolarization. Stimulate C alone, and I get a little hyperpolarization. But what if, instead of stimulating A more frequently, I stimulate A and B simultaneously, right? Then they release a um, depolarizing neurotransmitter that binds to a ligand-gated sodium channel, open them at the same time, and make it more likely that this axon hillock will hit threshold. So that is not a frequency stimulation, not a temporal stimulation, not over time, but over two different spaces. So A and B simultaneously, spatial summation, and that can get me to threshold as well. Okay, but can you add a positive and a negative and end up staying in the same place? Yeah, of course you can. So what if I stimulated A and C simultaneously? Well, it's not gonna get me closer to threshold. This would be like if A had a goal and C had a different goal and they were like working against one another. Um, so um, you can spatial uh, have spatial summation that adds to, that doesn't add up to changing the resting membrane potential at all. So.
Um, spatial summation, does it make sense to you that spatial summation requires convergence, right? It requires more than one presynaptic cell to actually have the concept of spatial summation even possible, okay? But um, temporal summation doesn't require summation or require convergence. Okay, last little tidbit before we get to all different types of neurotransmitters, and we'll be talking about drugs and diseases and that kind of stuff. So um, let's say that we have a synapse that's not working properly. Okay, um, let's say that um, I wish that I could be more happy, and I um, think that, and it's not this simple, that a bit more dopamine in certain um, synapses would do that for me. <coughs> How can I get that to occur? What do we do now? What's theoretically possible? What's possible in actuality? And then we'll learn some of these drugs and treatments and all those kinds of things. So in theory, we could do this first one, right? Make this presynaptic neuron make more dopamine. Make it release more dopamine. That's not very easy to do. And it's especially not very easy to do in one portion of the nervous system and not in another. And a lot of times dopamine will do something different in one place than in the other. So this top one is primarily theoretical. In most situations, it's really hard to just like say, oh, I want you to release more or make more of this. Um, <clears throat> but what if I wanted to mimic the appearance of more dopamine? Is there any way that I could do that? Yeah. Um, one of the things that you can do is inhibit these um, removal mechanisms, inhibit the reuptake, and then dopamine basically will re-stimulate the postsynaptic cell after it's done it once. It's kind of just like releasing more dopamine to the postsynaptic cells. It feels the same. Um, you could block a, an enzyme that breaks it down. Um, you could block the reuptake mechanisms, and we do have drugs that do those things for both dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin. There's a bunch of different um, drugs, and we'll talk about those. And then um, the other theoretical and also sometimes actual thing that you can do is interfere with the binding to the receptor. When you interfere with the binding to the receptor, what you're doing is taking in a drug or a chemical that either blocks the receptor's binding site so that you can prevent the neurotransmitter activating the receptor. So we would call these like blockers. Um, and those are um, categorized as an antagonist drug or chemical. They sit in the receptor and they don't allow the postsynaptic cell to have the normal response. Um, a lot of times these mm, can act like poisons. So um, there's, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of fugu, which is from pufferfish that have a, a neurotoxin that they produce as a defense mechanism. Um, people like to eat fugu. Apparently it's delicious, but it also has this little tingle that's like, hey, you almost died. Um, that one is an antagonist for a neurotransmitter. It's a neurotoxin. There's um, black mamba venom that also does the same thing. It's an antagonist for neurotransmitters. Honeybee venom does it, but it's usually just local and it doesn't go systemic, so it's not likely to kill you. And then um, interestingly, so think about this one for just a second and you can ask me about it in class. Caffeine is an antagonist to an excitatory neurotransmitter. So what it does, I'm sorry, it's an antagonist to an inhibitory neurotransmitter. I was testing you. So it's an antagonist for an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So if it blocks the inhibitory function of the neurotransmitter, then the postsynaptic cell is more likely to get excitation. So that's how caffeine actually works to wake you up. Mm. But again, a lot of these antagonist drugs or chemicals are um, poisons. Um, they will block a receptor and inhibit neurotransmitter function. Then there are what's called agonist drugs or chemicals. And agonists, um, so if I think of an antagonist as a blocker, I think of an agonist as a mimic. So what it does is um, if I, for instance, didn't, didn't have enough of this neurotransmitter, it would sit, it would look enough like the neurotransmitter that it would cause a response on the postsynaptic cell that was similar to the response that the neurotransmitter caused, okay? So it mimics the neurotransmitter. A lot of times it's not exactly the same, but it's 
good enough to get something going. And um, we'll talk about a few of these, but one of them um, is nicotine. Nicotine mimics acetylcholine in the central nervous system. And one of the things that acetylcholine does for us in the CNS is um, it enhances short-term attention and memory. So a lot of times people like nicotine because when they take it initially, it will make them feel on. But eventually you take enough of it and you'll downregulate your receptors and we have a whole other set of problems. Okay, so in the next series, we're going to start going into specific neurotransmitters. Just like with hormones, we don't cover all of them, but we cover the ones that I think you are probably going to run into in your life or uh, the lives of patients. And um, some of them are CNS neurotransmitters and some of them are PNS neurotransmitters and some of them are both. Okay.